I think people think of foreign media and everybody just thinks, oh, you're going to get sued. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, especially yeah, yeah. in the 90s, that was very, yeah, very true. Yeah. When I was in journalism school, um, the media law professor and I had a conversation and he was like, oh my God, you're Singaporean and you want to go mm. back there to be a journalist. <laughs> and it turned out that he had sort of fought the Feist and Economic Review uh, oh, defamation suit. And he was like, don't do it. Don't do it. Wow. <laughs> um, and he was just saying, you know, how sort of traumatizing that was for, for, for the company, right? I mean, yeah. essentially, it sort of bankrupted them in a, in a, in a pretty epic way, right? And yeah. shut down the Feist and Economic Review. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Yala, ba, 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 ba. your thrice weekly podcast where we talk about the hottest news with a touch of what, Terence? Good old humor. Good old humor, man. Yeah. But today we're going to be talking about more than just news because yeah. we have someone very interesting in our studio today mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. whose article we actually covered before back on a podcast 422, yes. uh, which was titled Washington Post Accuses Lian He Tsapao of Pro-China Slant. Mm. So with us today, we have the journalist who wrote that Washington Post article yeah. and it's none other than Shibani Metani, who is an investigative, international investigative correspondent for the Washington Post. Yes. So oh, welcome to <laughs> welcome to Yalaba. To clarify, Thank you is so it much. Metani or Matani? Metani, actually. Metani. Me- Metani is the more Indian Sindhi pronunciation. The way I say <laughs> it. Oh, right. yeah, so, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's correct. That's right. correct. But the way I say it, it's probably wrong, frankly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which is oh, Matani. Yeah. Matani, yeah, no, uh, Metani. You know, you me, you went for me. You know, the, the, the <laughs> Metani, that's the one Sindhi to another Sindhi. My, okay. my family has anglicized ourselves, clearly. Yeah? So, <laughs> so how, is, how is it you introduce it to a non Sindhi? Matani. 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 Yeah. yeah. Oh. You went, you went really, for me, that's what I was like. Me, yeah. Metani, yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah, almost like an invisible H. Yeah, yeah, correct. Like I said, we've anglicized ourselves, clearly. <laughs> yeah, but, but welcome to our podcast. Thank yeah, you so much. On. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so the last time we spoke about that article, uh, I mean, we had, we had not connected with you yet, uh, mm-hmm. but it was interesting for us given what it was talking about and also understanding that you are Singaporean. Mm-hmm. Uh, despite some of the articles that said, you know, this was written by a Western liberal uh, mm-hmm. or someone of of that background. Uh. So, so I mean, to understand, maybe, maybe you can, can like t- tell us about your journey into journalism to to set the context. Sure. Um, yes, I. for the record, I'm very much Singaporean, yeah. mm. born and raised uh, here. And um, I think my family is probably like third generation. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think I've, I feel very Singaporean more than more than anything else. Right. And that's really the context from which I, I come from when I approach sort of journalism and when I approach media and sort of what I do. Um, so, you know, I guess growing up here, especially as a minority, right, I think I mm. felt like there were gaps within our media landscape, right? Um, there, I, I felt like there were a lot of things that we couldn't really discuss out in the open. I yeah. felt like there were, you know, lines of reporting that were, especially then, right, in the, you know, 90s, 2000s, whatever, that were sort of not not like kosher, right, for our, our sort of domestic, you know, media scene and consumption. And so I think growing up, right, like reading The Straits Times or like reading the, the kind of media available to us and then seeing... The, the very like stark difference between the coverage of Singapore from like The Economist or International Herald Tribune and all of that then, remember, you know, Wired, right, Disneyland with the death penalty. It seemed mm. like there was such a big gulf, right? And I think that started sort of like piquing my interest in journalism in general and, and sort of understanding like, okay, like why are we sort of here with our domestic media and then why are foreigners writing about us in, in, in this sort of like totally polarized way. Yeah. Um, and so that I think began sort of my curiosity about the media, curiosity about journalism. You know, I also, um, I guess I was more the sort of arts inclined kind of person. So, you know, our schooling system pushes us in that direction, right? Mm-hmm. And then I became sort of better at kind of writing and, and all of that. Anyway, so I think I decided quite early that I wanted to be a journalist. Journalist. I, I felt like that was sort of my my calling, or that was sort of my place. Um, so I mm. sort of like geared my whole kind of career towards that. Um, and so when I went to university, I was the editor in chief of the the campus paper, and then I studied journalism um, at a graduate level as well um, in in New York. So then I think kind of immediately I was like, okay, let me see what opportunities lie in Singapore, right? Because, mm. you know, things then were were sort of 
very optimistic in this region. There was a lot of interest in Southeast Asia, like the story of growth in this region was was something that a lot of the financial publications were covering. And there are a lot of financial publications in mm, Singapore, yeah. right? Reuters, Bloomberg, all of that, been here for a long time. So in 2011, I managed to get a job um, with the Wall Street Journal uh, covering covering Southeast Asia and covering the region. So immediately when I, when I moved back, um, that was the time of like, MBS just coming up, mm-hmm. right? F1, like Singapore was was really being branded and sort of marketed in a, in a totally different way. Um, one of the first pieces I wrote um, when I came back to Singapore was about uh, how Singapore is becoming this place for like the new wealthy. <clears throat> that was magazine length piece and actually stirred quite a lot of debate, right? Of whether like, is this where we want to be as a society, as a country? I mean, obviously mm-hmm. there's quite a lot of good to it, but then there's also some bad, right? And that was, you know, 2011, 2012, where the issue of foreigners was, was quite sensitive here. Mm-hmm. So I think that was like the first piece I did that I was realizing like, wow, okay, having this sort of like insider but outsider voice can actually have a disproportionate sort of impact here, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously... I'm from here, so I, I I can like sort of see and feel some of those changes. But then I have the space to write for foreign media organization. Um, anyway, then I moved to Myanmar when things started opening there in 20, uh, 12, 13. Mm-hmm. Um, that was during the democratic transition. It was a very like, you know, optimistic, hopeful time. Um, the whole region, right, actually seemed like it was on an upswing then, right? More democrat- democratization, including in Singapore, right? Our elections then were getting like quite exciting, you know, more like opposition uh, sort of rallies and, and all that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, we, we followed that trajectory at, at the Wall Street Journal for, for a while across the region. Um, and then I think things really started to shift, um, mostly with the election of Trump. Mm. Um, I was in the U.S. Um, covering that when Trump won. It was such an eye-opening experience for me, right? Because I think you grow up looking at the West and you think like, okay, that is like the the, the holy grail, right, of journalism mm. and of, mm. of, you know, sort of democratic openness and freedom. And then you see, you know, Trump winning and then what what that meant for like us as an industry there, right? And then, you know, that was, that was a, a whole journey. Um, anyway, you know, I, I went to the U.S. and I I think for me, it was an opportunity to kind of um, learn more about U.S. media and how it works there. Um, and, you know, I think when you're from the region, right, they always like kind of, I don't know, they pigeonhole you, right? Like, mm-hmm. okay, you're Southeast Asian, so you cover Southeast Asia. But I kind of wanted to prove, you know, um, that I could do more more than that. And that was really my impetus for moving to the U.S. Um, but I, you know, I, I always felt like my calling was reporting regionally and reporting on, on, on the region. And that was what I had to offer. So when the Washington Post um, put out a opening for a correspondent, um, Southeast Asia correspondent in 2018, uh, I applied for that, got that job and, and moved back to cover the region, but from Hong Kong as as my base. So I've been with the Washington Post since 2018. Um, I was first the Southeast Asian Hong Kong bureau chief and then got this new role um, at the end of 2022. And then you came back to Singapore. Correct. And mm. so I'm I'm based now in Singapore. Mm, I see, I see, I see. So so like the title International Investigative Correspondent. Like um is there like uh is there a definite slant to doing stuff that is more investigative, more long form, more incisive? Yeah, definitely. So I think, you know, we we realize, right, that very few media organizations today can actually devote resources to longer term coverage, right? I mean, the reality is because of all the strains on the media in the US, but also globally, right? You know, social media, fall of advertising revenue, uh, fall of subscriptions, so on and so forth, that um, we have to be more targeted with our reporting and have to Mm. offer something that's different. So, you know, just offering news and trying to compete on that is not enough. And maybe we should try to put resources towards more like long form investigative pieces. Um, Yeah. And I feel very privileged to have that as a, as, as a sort of remit. It's a very rare kind of opportunity to kind of have in this part of the world. Uh, And the team is kind of new. Uh, It was formed. Yeah. In 2022 as well. Um, I'm the only one in, in Asia and I have colleagues in, in London, uh, and the US. Um, actually, the team was meant to be, you know, global with one person in each region, but um, we've had a few cuts and, you know, buyouts and stuff. So mm-hmm. um, our expansion kind of halted a bit, but the the goal was for a person in each region to kind of collaborate with the existing network of correspondents mm. and try to focus in on investigation, enterprise, like long-term features and so on. Mm. Mm. I, see, I, see, I see. Actually, I just wanted to just go back to something you were saying earlier about when you decided that, you know, journalism was going to be your calling at a young age. Uh, um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that was during a time when, when you know, uh, conversations about career 
especially amongst young people, was usually about traditional things like mm-hmm. being a doctor, lawyer, engineer, whatever. Um, and it must have been you must have been quite against the grain to actually say out loud that you wanted to be a journalist. Now. Was there that that feeling that you know um, even like speaking up or you know writing about contentious issues in Singapore uh, was not worth the trouble? And like, why was there like pushback from family or friends about this this career path that you were choosing? Yeah, to an, to an extent, because I mean, I think people think of foreign media and everybody just thinks, oh, you're going to get sued, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, especially yeah. in the 90s, that was very, yeah. very true, yeah. right? I mean, you can name every single one of them. Actually, it was so interesting when I was in journalism school, um, the media law professor um, and I had a conversation and he was like, oh my God, you're Singaporean and you want to go mm. back there to be a journalist. And it turned out that he had sort of fought the Feist and Economic Review uh, oh, defamation suit. And he was like, don't do it, don't do it. Wow. <laughs> um, and he was just saying, you know, how sort of traumatizing that was for, for, for the company, right? I mean, yeah. essentially, it sort of bankrupted them in a, in a, in a pretty epic way, right? And yeah. shut down the Feist and Economic Review. So, yeah, of course, there was there was a certain degree of, of pushback. Um, you know, I think there were definitely people in my family who were like, you sure you don't want to be a lawyer? Sure, sure. There's still <laughs> chance. There's still time. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I just felt like, I think I'm kind of a stubborn person, but I also felt like it was just something that, you know, I had decided that I wanted to do. And I guess I just tried to sort of make it happen. Yeah. Mm. But even at that time, you knew that in Singapore, the climate for journalism uh, may not be as open. You were aware of that. For sure. And I think I had I had the, 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 the privilege of having, you know, actually very open conversations in the classroom around this kind of stuff. I had mm. teachers who were quite open-minded, who brought that up and actually nurtured like sort of critical thinking. Um, there were a number of people within my um class in JC actually who became journalists interestingly mm, oh, enough. Okay. So so yeah, I mean I I think um there there were definitely avenues that I felt like that was still encouraged um within the the sort of school environment that I was part of. So that was really good. good. Yeah. But mm-hmm. but wasn't the I mean in Singapore journalism is kind of at least in the government's eyes like right is meant to be uh not really questioning of the government's policies but in 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 essence in a way of like it aids the nation building process uh. yep. so so there's a whole philosophical difference about what a journalist what a journalist is supposed to do uh. was that something that um you know w- was difficult to reconcile with what you were learning and studying in the US during that period well i think i started sort of questioning that narrative from a, a pretty young age right because yeah. i think Okay, so the narrative is that the 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 yes the 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 role of the press, especially you know the SPH kind of media core press, mm. is not to be a, a a sort of check and balance, right? But mm. to be part of nation building, right? To be yeah. part of your 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 kind of understanding and and, and sort of nurturing of a, you know society values, your know, culture, Singapore, which 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 is fine. But then why is it that when I felt like I read or consumed that media, I didn't feel represented even mm. though I'm Singaporean. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I just felt like there was something like there was a disconnect, right, between a lot of the things I felt like I grew up sort of experiencing and feeling and what was made available in, in sort of public kind of intellectual discourse and, and sphere, of which the media is obviously a key part of, right? Mm. Um so, you know, especially when it especially when it comes to race. So, you know, I felt like, okay, maybe there are other ways to kind of open up conversations in different different kind of avenues. But, but was that realization something that dawned upon you or was it like your friends or family were talking about it? Because I'm thinking when I was growing up, that did not occur to me at all. Maybe I was just an ignorant uh, guy who just liked watching football or something. But mm. uh, to have that sort of realization at a young age, like, or was it just part of your, your personality, part of your nature? Maybe, m- maybe it was like, Oh wait, this is interesting. Why are all these newspapers getting sued? Let me let me like go and find uh, out. Right? So looking for so, trouble, you like you, you're interested in all, by the all stress and effect, right? Like when mm, when yeah. something becomes like sort of so taboo or so like you know like mm. like considered like okay, this is this is bad. What they did something wrong. You you kind of want to investigate like okay, why like mm. what's what's in here that you think is so damaging that you need to like kind of go after these these sort of newspapers or kind of challenge this view in such a sort of strident way right um, I, mm. I don't know I, it's it's very hard to, to to kind of sort of pinpoint but I think I always felt a bit like okay like I I, I want to know so much more but I don't find it you know I want to mm. talk about so much more I want to discuss so much more but it's the avenues to do that are sort of quite limited 
I see, I see, I see. But okay. I think that's changed also. I just want to caveat that. Okay. Oh, okay. I think yeah. that's got a, it's got a much better, right, in yeah. this in mm. this environment that we're in today compared to what was available to us, right, in the 90s yeah. and you yeah, know, 2000s, definitely. for sure. Definitely. So, I mean, like like kind of because you just mentioned the Streisand effect, like, part of the reason that you're here <laughs> talking so is because, <laughs> you know, you, you did precisely that. Like, you know, you, you wrote about um, what Cao Pao's uh, you know, the, the political leanings of some of the contributors to Cao Pao and, and all. And that has provoked a rather quite a strong response from uh, the press as well as even the official government channels as well, mm-hmm. right? Um, but what what has, what, can you tell us, walk, walk us through a little bit of what motivated you into, you know, pursuing sure. that angle and, and writing that article? Sure. So I, I guess I'll start with a couple of things. One is that, you know, I, I lived in Hong Kong, right? Mm. From uh, 2018 to 2022 until I moved back to Singapore. And obviously the most defining thing that happened in my time there was the protests and the crackdown um, that happened from the from, from Beijing. Um, that was something that was so kind of defining for me as a person in my career in every other way, right? Because we were sort of on the front row um, in this extremely sort of unexpected well, unexpected at the time, but obviously if you look back to history, also kind of expected, um, you know, large scale mass demonstration that at times mm-hmm. became quite violent, but also, you know, uh, included what more than two million of a population of seven million, right? So that was that was something that I, I had I had experienced at that time. And whenever I came back to Singapore in those like sort of like quick trips that I had while I was living in, in Hong Kong, you know, even interacting with, you know, taxi drivers or friends or you know, like the bartender at the bar or whatever who would say like, oh, you're visiting from Hong Kong. Like, mm. wow, they are so violent. They are so destructive. Like, we are so lucky as Singaporeans and we don't have that, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, kind of intrigued because I was like, hmm, I wonder where your news is coming from that you only sort of see or are bringing up those kind of perspectives and, and, and that point of view, right? And I'm very like intrigued as to why people are not saying, Two million people protested peacefully, and the government didn't listen to them. Like how tragic, right? Oh, like you know, it was it was interesting that that was the that was the narrative of of a lot of people. And so, like in, in talking to people here, um, some people pointed out that the the, the coverage of Zhao Bao was actually leaning very very much to the sort of Chinese narratives, mm-hmm. and that was something that was happening within Chinese language uh, newspapers, uh, actually all over Southeast Asia. Malaysia Kini did a really good investigation too mm-hmm. on how uh, Chinese language media in Malaysia was was really sort of like uh, parroting and, and sort of amplifying disinformation, right, that was coming out of that of that time in, in Hong Kong. So that was kind of intriguing to me and sort of stayed at the, at the back of my, my, my mind. Uh, and then when I came back to Singapore, um, you know, one of the, the the sort of projects the Washington Post was taking on at the time was looking at the way China was manifesting its power in sort of unexpected ways um, globally. So we mm-hmm. we did this sort of China Reach project, and you know, uh, we all sort of contributed different different stories to that. Actually, the the Zaobao piece was one of three that was part of that that series that we did um, in 2023. Um, so that, that, that was the context, right? It wasn't just like a standalone piece. It was part of like this, like broader kind of thematic thing that we, we were looking at. Um, but you know, I thought, okay, fine. So many people are saying like, Zapa is this, Zapa is that. So maybe what we should do is have a very rigorous, like data-based analysis of their coverage. And, you know, there are many, many different ways of kind of looking at Chinese narratives or Chinese media influence in Singapore, right? Mm. And, and I think that has been one of the fair criticisms of, of the piece. It's like, why look at Zhao Bao? Why single them out? There's so much, right? There's WeChat, there's WhatsApp, there's Channel 8, there's, you know, other, you know, there's uh, broadcast TV like CCTV4 that, you know, is um, on StarHub and mm. uh, Singtel, you know, cable and stuff, right? Why, why just look at Zhao Bao? I think one of the key things that you have with a newspaper is like quantifiable things, right? So you can create like a scraping tool mm and amass like a database of articles and actually, you know, be able to run a scraper through to like pick up on certain words and certain phrasing, right? And, you know, a lot of these words and phrasings that for people kind of familiar with, you know, Chinese state media or Chinese state propaganda, right, comes, um, 
you know, like foreign influence, uh, you know, meddling in domestic affairs, like mm. all these kind of things are like very specific phrases you can you can kind of take out and, and sort of filter through or you can see like the sources that they are citing. You can see whether it's sort of state media sources, pro Taiwanese sources or kind of more neutral sources and so on. So we thought, OK, um, why don't we try to do this then? Why don't we try to create a, a, a big database of articles, of commentary pieces and so on and, and really try to analyze this in like a, you know, very sort of method you know in a sort of very comprehensive way so that's what that's that's what we did basically and we um you know managed to kind of find like every story on for example hong kong and the protests mm -hmm. the Uyghur issue and xinjiang um covid um and uh, a bunch of other themes within within that that specific period and then you know we 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 used um, a scraper, we looked through that, and that's how we, we sort of came up with our analysis, right? So again, you know, we just wanted to make sure it was like really, really rigorous and that we did it sort of properly. Um, yeah. And, and what our findings were, um, as the piece noted, was that um, not only were like the articles sort of trending towards these sort of pro-China narratives, particularly um, on subjects that were very, uh, you know, sensitive and touchy to China, mm. like the Hong Kong issue, like the Uyghur issue, like Taiwan especially, um, but also that there were these, um, you know, opinion pieces that were written by uh, people who were portrayed as kind of neutral academics, like, uh, who you know, just kind of experts on the issue. But actually, if you dig a little bit deeper, investigate their background, they are actually, you know, CCP officials. So that's, yeah, that's what we found basically. Mm, and, and how long did that whole process take? About Five months. Five months. Yeah. So before you published it, did you all foresee some sort of like uh, reception or backlash? To an extent, yes, because I had already engaged with Zaobao um, on an official level from mm. very, very early on in the process. I mean, we gave them really, really months to respond and also, you know, due diligence, right? We also approached the government and told them that we would be doing this and this was our findings. And we and really, we, we had approached them in, I think, February or March. And then the story only ran in June. So they, they had quite a lot of time to, you know, um, respond, to engage with us so that, you know, nobody could say this was a surprise, right? I mean, we, yeah. we practice what you call no surprises journalism. Mm. So all of the findings in the piece, our methodology, our sort of, um, you know, process, everything was was made known to Zaobao and to, um, to the same, you know, to the people who we deal with as journalists, right? Mm. Which is the Ministry of Information, basically. Mm. Yeah. And, and then the subsequent... Um not not say backlash, but like pushback, right? Mm. How did it feel being at the center of that? Because I mean, coming from from people who are not in journalism, the only thing we know is when, when we watch like fiction, I mean, um, narrative shows about you know like reporters breaking big stories, and it looks like wow, there's a lot of excitement. You know, people in the office high fiving each other and all that. Like, what did it feel for you when? When suddenly you saw that there was a, a lot of buzz about what you're. Doing. I work from home, so it's like me <laughs> and my dog and my husband. So it wasn't a very People like high five, you yeah. know high, high five, five. Big like hugs. like all around. But I mean, I think it was something that I knew mm. because I'm from here mm. that there would be backlash towards, or because already I I got a certain amount of pushback from yeah. both Sao Paulo and the government when I was mm. engaging with them in the process. So I was kind of bracing a little bit for it in a way that I don't think, you know, necessarily people in Washington would have been bracing for it, you mm. know, um, because obviously I know Singapore uh, quite intimately. But yeah, I mean, I think I think what I found in the immediate um, few hours after publishing was extremely gratifying, right? There were so many people who were like academics, you know, regular Singaporeans uh, who were all like really, really engaging with, with the material. And in a very genuine way and saying, you know, like this has happened within my family too. Like my dad or my grandma, my uncle, my auntie, you know, used to be very like kind of like neutral and sort of political issues, but they've become super pro CCP and they've become super pro Xi Jinping and I don't understand what's going on. Mm. And people were even like emailing me to say stuff like, okay, very interesting and valid that you look at Zaobao, but my dad, for example, doesn't really speak Chinese. He doesn't consume Chinese language media, but he still, you know, has these views. So I'm I'm trying to understand why mostly English speaking people have also had this kind of transition. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was actually really fulfilling, right? It was doing what it should have done, which was provoking more debate discussion mm. um, on, on the topic, which is what as a journalist is what you want to do, right? You want to yeah. create space for conversation, right? You, you're, you're not meant to be the last word ever, right? Mm -hmm. On the topic, you're meant to 
create the the space so that more people can like discuss and talk about it and everything. But then, you know, obviously after that sort of very positive interaction, I mean, the amount of kind of troll backlash on my Twitter email was so like overwhelming. I had to like silent my phone because it was just, it got in like kind of crazy. I think like even worse than when I covered Hong Kong and I couldn't really understand why mm. or where I was coming from. I think partly is because Twitter is now under different ownership, and mm. a bit less rigorous about sort of filtering, you know, yeah. comments and, and stuff like that. But yeah, various like people reached out to me being like, are you, are you okay? Like everybody's really? like, mm. getting very angry with you on Twitter. And it's just, I think, I think it's different, you know, when you're from a country, right? Because, you know, then the the, the Sunday Times ran a, the, the response from the government on the front page, right? Mm-hmm. And that's obviously something that is read by like my family and friends. They're like, oh my gosh, Bunny, what now? <laughs> like, why are you on the papers? <laughs> like, what is going on? So yeah, I oh, think... So you got those questions from your... Like, yeah, friend. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I think the, the that's the difference between, you know, covering something in your home country versus covering something that, you know, you're, mm. you're a foreign, foreign correspondent, right? There's always mm. a little bit more of like a, a slightly like... Um, I don't know. You feel a little bit more vulnerable, put it this way, when when mm. you're from a place and you're covering the thing in the place. You know? But on the flip side, did it also give you more uh, motivation to cover it? Because, I mean, it ultimately affects the place that you are from, right? For sure. And that's always like what I intended to do, right? I mean, I think, I think you know, using, using our resources, using our ability to kind of do this kind of data-driven work, mm-hmm. right? In, you know, the place I grew up, like that is the... the the highest bar, right, for mm-hmm. me, right? I mean, that's what you want to do, really. You want to create. And this, obviously, the issue, as is quoted in the story, right, is something that is existential for Singapore, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when you have, and I mean, there's something the Singapore government itself has said, right? When you have um, any other country, wh- whether it be whoever, right, China, Malaysia, US, whatever, telling Singaporeans to define themselves in a way that goes against our kind of multi-ethnic, multi-racial sort of ethos as a country. I mean, that is a dangerous thing, right? So it yeah. is an issue that is very, very core, I think, to, to Singapore. And so I think I felt very sort of gratified that I was able to kind of like open up some conversation around it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, um, largely speaking, how like how how have things been since? Like, because you're mentioning that's a big firestorm of trolls and all that. But have things settled or, or ha- how have you thought about it differently or come to terms with it and, and everything? Well, definitely. And I mean, I think one of the major things that has happened since the peace um, is that Singapore designated its first mm. person mm. under under FICA, right? Yeah. Uh, Philip Chan, who, you know, is not explicitly stated that he was trying to kind of further the goals of, you know, China um, in, in Singapore. But it is made clear from all of the reporting kind of around it, right? That yeah. that, that it is it, he was designated for fear that he was pushing a political agenda that mm. came from China, right? And, you know, within that, the coverage of the Straits Times and CNA and other local media around that specifically mentioned his articles and his approach to Zabao. So mm. it kind of felt, you know, I mean, not, I don't want to say like validating. I'm sure that mm-hmm. the, the, the government was looking into this like sort of long, long before I was. Um, but it sort of felt like, okay, you know, uh, it blunted a lot of the criticism, put it this way. And, mm-hmm. and, and another thing that happened, you know, obviously there was a lot of pushback from the government, but, um, you know, our prime minister spoke at Zaobao's 100 year anniversary dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you read that, you know, speech in in full he actually has um a few paragraphs you know amid a lot of the congratulatory stuff that says you know a lot of people look at Zhao Bao as a Singaporean paper and you know Zhao Bao must always be careful that it's portrayed and seen as such and you know we have to check who writes for Zhao Bao we have to mm. be very vigilant about who writes for our opinion pieces so that we can never be construed as anything but a Singaporean paper um and I thought that was quite interesting as well because that was you, that was a public speech so that means you're saying like if reading between the lines he's also sort of like saying something about what they need to do more of like, right I mean <laughs> <laughs> I did oh, say that yeah. but you can you, you can read it for yourself yeah, you're, you're talking to a journalist though you know, I know, I know I, I, that's why I'm coming from a lay person anger I'm just trying to clarify I'm but doing yes, my own the speech is public it can be read by anyone so no but did you like send links to the speech to all those trolls and all and like just saying nah, nah you see. can't engage with trolls can't I mean there's this like that's a 
really nuanced uh, thing for them to expect a troll to read and go through that, right? Yeah, true. The mo true. is not nuanced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The mo is literally Shibani wants Singapore to be controlled by India. I mean, yeah. that's the oh, that really? you the got a lot comments of that. that I got. Yes, oh, uh, it, was, it was really, really ridiculous. So. But I, I mean, I, I'm asking also just kind of like even for you personally, like because it's quite shocking to hear that you know there's this really overwhelming sense of like trolls coming out of nowhere and coming in sort of like uh, you know I, I don't want to say making people fearful but like in Singapore we have this thing like oh you know you got to look over your shoulder if you if you are speaking up about something or against the institution and all that and I've always felt like that you know in, in some sense that yeah kind of uh, makes people self-censor so much uh, and, and they don't even question at a base level certain things they're like I mean you, you, it's something worth discussing. It's just talking about it, asking questions. It's fine now, you know. And I, that's why I was kind of curious, like how, yeah, how for you since then you've you've managed to, uh, you know, overcome it and think about it and also sort of reconcile with like, okay, this is, you know, because you live in Singapore now, like this is how, it's, uh, you know, your family and friends are also going to talk to you about you and everything. Uh. Well, I can say that for the, for the troll thing and the pushback to journalism, right, that is something, unfortunately, our whole industry is experiencing kind of everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's true in the US where there is so much, so much, like, um, pushback against the, the media these days, right? Especially mm -hmm. when you talk about, like, alt-right or people who cover, like, tech and stuff like that. It can yeah. be really, really sort of scary and, and, and dangerous, right? Like, when we... Um, when our journalists covered, you know, Trump in, in D.C., some of them needed, like, security, right? Mm, it was, like, so yeah. bad, right? And Gen 6, everything, right? I mean, journalists have for a long time been, been front and center. What more in Southeast Asia, right, where there's really mm. no protections, you know, for the press anyway, yeah. whether here or within our neighboring countries, right? Um, so it's part of the cause. I mean, I think one of the things that and has been spoken about, you know, quite a lot and, and, and documented is when this trolling becomes very personal and identity-based. And that's something mm. the... Like CCP trolls are very well documented in in doing now, right? I mean, a lot of foreign media and org foreign media organizations hire ethnic Chinese, but American or Australian Chinese or whatever to cover, you know, China, right? Or to mm, cover those mm. topics. Um, and you know, it's notable both of our Southeast Asia correspondents, myself and another Singapore-based correspondent, are both Singaporeans, right? So mm. more and more and. You know, I'm very grateful for this. Foreign media organizations are realizing, okay, there is value in hiring locals, right? Mm. Because they understand the region, they have expertise, mm. they have language, you know, they can. But um, that's been sort of seized on, I think, by a lot of these like bad actors or state actors to say, like, look at you, you're betraying your country, you're betraying your, you know, the way you grew up or like whatever, right? And that's that's very common. My 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 colleagues who cover China experience that a lot. My Indian colleagues who cover India experience that a lot. Mm. Like it's it's sort of all over, and I think that's the and that also happened to me in the case of of doing this this work in Singapore. And I think that intense sort of like identity thing can be very uncomfortable, right? And it it really makes you like have this sort of like I don't know like guilt around it yeah. sometimes because people are like kind of using your identity or your heritage or, or the way you look or your name to kind of like attack you, right? Which mm. I think can be a very deeply uncomfortable thing. If they, if, if it was just about the paper, that's yeah. one thing, right? If it's like Western Media, Washington Post, but then if it's like Shibani, then it's like another thing, right? You mm. know, like that's a different layer of kind of personalization to mm. it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so then, do you ever feel like, um, like, are you, do you ever feel a conflict where sometimes putting out a piece or making a statement or researching something, oh, could it do more harm than good? I mean, you might still be exposing the truth, but, um, you know, with all your experience around the world in different kind of media climates, and then you come back to Singapore where, I mean, it's still, it's very different from what it was 2011, but it's still not the freest. Like, has, has that perspective changed or do you ever find yourself in conflict with that? I think mostly the, the harm reduction thing comes with our sources, right? I mean, we mm. always have a degree of protection that they don't have and they're much more vulnerable, um, especially when you're talking to people inside organizations, right? I mm. mean, I did, as the piece notes, I speak to I spoke to people within Zaobao and outside of it too. I was much more concerned about, you know, protecting the identities mm. of those people and the people who shared the stories about their own families and their own experiences with me as I would be, say, in Hong Kong when you're speaking to people who are in jail or so on and so forth, right? And mm. I think... You know, I have been in a lot of kind of difficult situations throughout my career, right, where source protection was first and foremost, right, in, in, in the work that we that we do. So so it's it's less it's less about 
about me, I would say, in, mm. in any of those situations in the harm versus good thing. But I think, you know, my, my belief is like, as long as your journalism is factual, rigorous, um, you know, neutral, you're not, when, I'm not coming from a place of like, we were trying to like, bring down one country or slander one place or another, right? It's just sort of talking about something that was just below the surface that a lot of people are actually talking about. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're just trying to bring that out to sort of public discourse and, and discussion, right? I mean, ultimately, that that's what our roles should be, you know? Mm -hmm. That's the way I think about it, I guess. So over the years, have you, like, have you become a lot more optimistic about journalism, uh, especially journalism in this part of the world? Is there parts of you that have become jaded or just a bit more... Like like any change in perspectives, because you know you you grew up. You said you had this very uh, curious question about foreign media, local media. But after working in journalism for so long, yeah, I think things are getting much better. I mean, I think the uh, a lot has happened in the media industry, right? And and there's definitely with the rise of tech and social media being being a sort of bifurcation, which has been um, in some ways very bad for legacy actors, right? Because mm. you know we we don't really know the way forward in terms of like advertising and, you know, monetization and whatever, right? That's like a whole separate discourse and discussion. But, you know, you have seen, right, this like clamor and hunger for like various other sources of information, right? Mm. And I think with that, I mean, obviously this podcast is testament to that as well, right? People want to sort of hear different perspectives. People want to engage with sort of news and conversation in, in a different way. Our local media scene is far more vibrant than any time in, in sort of my history, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the history of this this country has gone through so many iterations, right? And I think it's it's only sort of growing kind of stronger and, and stronger, right? With places like JOM, uh, even, you know, Mekong Review, which uh, Kristen Han edits, um, which are very, very like interesting kind of literary regional perspectives. Um, you know, there's there's uh, obviously Rappler in the Philippines and Maria Reza has done more to open up the journalism there than really anything that has sort of come before. Mm. It's been it's been really amazing to see. On the other hand, I mean, I think both the business model and the sort of safety and protection of journalists are coming under strain in a way it has never before as well, right? I mean, what we've seen throughout the region is sort of the, the the sort of solidifying of strongman rule, right? I mean, if you look around the region, Cambodia run by Hun Sen Sun, you know, you have um, another Marcos again in the Philippines, mm -hmm. you have Prabowo just winning in Indonesia, like uh, all of these, and then, you know, the coup in Myanmar, everywhere, right? Compared to when I first moved back to the region, you see um, just like a hardening of, of kind of more authoritarian, you know, um, kind of, rule. Um, and speaking to journalists in the region, as I, as I often do, right, I think people feel at threat constantly, right? And they feel like the, the space for them to navigate is like, you know, even smaller and smaller. So within that, that context, actually, Singapore is, is, a, is, is, is a relative mm. bright spot, actually, compared mm. to, to a lot of, a lot of places, you know, yeah. where, where, I mean, the fear is literally getting killed or kidnapped or whatever, right? And yeah. that's happening literally in our neighbors. So, yeah, I, I did, I did mm. sense your optimism in, in the Rice Media article where you interviewed as well, which was like, oh, okay, that's that's quite interesting to hear because, you know, people say that, oh, you know, you're criticizing Singapore and all these things. But at the same time, you're, you're saying positive things about the, the scene here and all. But I did want to go back to something you alluded to earlier, like, um, you know, those people who don't even read Chinese newspapers, Singaporeans <laughs> who don't interact with uh, Chinese newspaper or the Chinese media in Singapore, like... Um, and maybe they, some of them might be thinking like, why is this a bother? You know, like uh, so many Singaporeans, we read from so many different sources. Why is it a matter that uh, Lian He Cao Pao, I mean, you know, maybe they make a, an economic decision that they want to appeal more to a, you know, pro-China mm -hmm. base that because their, their newspaper goes out in China and everything. Like why, why does that matter to the general Singaporean who maybe doesn't even interact with a newspaper on, on a daily basis? I, I would say two things. One is the context of Xi Jinping's stated global ambitions. Mm -hmm. um, Xi Jinping has 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 publicly stated um, that he believes overseas Chinese to be a sort of vector of, of sort of influence um, mm -hmm. and kind of, uh, you know, reclaiming the, 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 the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation, right, is the phrase. And so that appeal is is going out not just to, you know, mainland Chinese who are overseas or Hong Kongers or, or Taiwanese, right, who are all considered to be, you know, Chinese, right? But um, 
Malaysian Chinese, Indonesian Chinese, Thai Chinese, Filipino Chinese, Singaporean Chinese. And Southeast Asia is is home to the largest, you know, ethnic Chinese population outside of mainland China, right? Mm. And, you know, as as I as I said before, um, I think the the issue of of influence um along those lines is something that you know, my reporting shows as well, the Singapore government is also worried about, right? It's not just, you know, um, me coming in as a, as a foreigner and saying like, or, or as a foreign media organization saying, I'm, I'm worried about it. Is it that, that's not what I'm saying. Actually, the government's worried about it. There are a lot of people in Singapore who are worried about it. Um, and, and that was sort of borne out in, in our reporting, right? And it's actually an issue that, that, that they, they have looked at and studied and, you know, you can see, you know, play out in the FICA designation as well. So, I think the, the the Singaporean government is certainly attuned to the fact that um, Xi Jinping, who is a sort of different kind of leader in Chinese history, right, is is really pushing that, and the fear of sort of stoking divided loyalties is is sort of real, right? Especially when we're a majority Chinese country, especially when you know we have this sort of fragile kind of history of ethnicity and race and and so on, which you know really even you know, the Kuan Yu was attuned to from mm. the very, very beginning, right? And mm. it's sort of baked into our history, it's baked into our consciousness. So yeah, it's, it is it is something that is not just like a, a, a concern that I'm sort of, you know, raising out of, of nowhere, right? It, mm. it is it is worn out um, that it is something that is being sort of discussed um, very openly. Um, but, you know, secondly, um, I think that um, the, the the sort of thing that, the, the, the point is that no other country can sort of say that in Singapore, right? Like the, the US or Malaysia can't come in and say like, all of you need to be like loyal to mm. America or loyal to Malaysia because that, that is not an argument that has the same sort of traction, right? There is yeah. something quite specific in doing that in, in Mandarin to the majority ethnic group here, mm. right? So that, that that's like, that's the difference. That's why a lot of people say like, okay, then why not talk about influence coming from the US or influence coming from other places? And you know, there, there certainly is, but none of them have the same sort of ethnic kind of grounds or ethnic kind of appeal yeah. Yeah. as what is coming from the, the kind of mainland Chinese sort of narrative and propaganda. And the, the last thing I would also say is Singapore is playing this really important geopolitical role right now, right? Mm. Um, it is, especially after what's happened to Hong Kong, the, the, the sort of place where dialogue and discussion can happen, right? Mm. Shangri-La Dialogue is a great example of that. It is a place where the US and China meet often. It is a country that hosts a lot of this debate and, and, mm. and sort of dialogue between the two superpowers amid these like global tensions. And so pe when people read Sao Pao, they should see it, right, as a reflection of Singapore's kind of very neutral geopolitical mm. stance, right, which is that we don't take sides, you know, we, we 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 don't want to see this like great power rivalry kind of spillover and so on and so forth. So it's also like perception, right? If, if for example, you're Taiwan and you're reading Taobao and you're seeing um, really inflammatory stuff there that says, you know, Taiwan is, is naive and they should, you know, um, realize that their future is, you know, like... Uh, being part of China or whatever, you know, people might get mi mixed views, right? They might mm. think, is this coming from the Singapore government? Is this coming from an opinion columnist? And mm. that's because of the relationship SPH Media has with our government, right? They're mm. seen as, as very close to each other, right? Mm. I mean, I, I don't think it's a secret that when people read Straits Times or, or CNA, they have the sense that, okay, this is something that the government is okay with putting mm. out there, right? Um, and so, you know, if people read Taobao and there's something really inflammatory there. People think, okay, is the government okay with this narrative or, mm. or what? Like, what's going on? And so I think that's why it, it matters disproportionately. Because mm. well. if Lian Hats Abba were totally private, then it would be a lot less of an issue. La. Correct. And that's why we, we actually looked at a bunch of private um, media outlets as well and like looked at narratives and stuff that were being perpetuated there. But, you know, and, and I think we explained this in, in our piece, right? That, that the reason why we chose Sao Paulo is because Sao Paulo was always seen as this like diplomatic tool that the Singaporean government had in engagement with China. Back mm -hmm. to Deng Xiaoping era, back to the Guan Yu era, right? It was seen, you know, with the Zaba was like the first foreign news outlet to be distributed within China, right? There is a certain kind of diplomatic weight you have within that and a certain, and, and they, they are proud of it and they should be proud of it, you know, but mm. I think the, the the goal, right, and and it's a stated goal for Zaobao as well, it's what they said in their rebuttal, right? They they want to always maintain the Singaporean perspective and be seen as a Singaporean newspaper, right? So that's why it's important to study sort of what's coming out of it. Yeah. Mm. Like, Terrence, does a lot of your family read Lian No. 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 Not me, not me, no. But, but I mean, but but what you said about the 
the narratives that are coming out, not just on Zappa, but like even YouTube. And uh, anecdotally, I've seen a lot of uh, friends and older parents just almost like like watching a toddler watching like a cartoon or something. And they're just mindlessly just uh, watching well, what is obviously uh, propaganda pieces, like, mm-hmm. right? In read by a robot in Mandarin. Uh. So it, that's kind of scary to me, like, because, uh, yeah, as, as a, you know, as a Singaporean who doesn't engage with the newspaper daily, uh, I'm like, wow, I, I, we don't even uh, analyze to a level what those, what those, those propaganda pieces are saying. Uh. And then, uh, the fact that they're so targeted towards uh, such a, such a, a demographic in Singapore is kind of scary. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I remember Leonard Zappa got in some controversy a few times already. I can't remember what. The mm. critical race theory thing. Yes. Oh, yes, 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 critical oh, race yeah, theory. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, Leonard Zappa was also the only newspaper to cover our parking day uh, installation years ago. Oh, Remember yeah. at Tanjung Baga? Yeah, but I don't think there's any race building. There was no race building. Uh, no, no, yeah. I mean, country, <laughs> nation building. No nation building yeah, thing. Yeah, there yeah. Oh, uh, but you know, going back to something else that you said um, uh, when you were talking about your journey into journalism, um, there was that one piece you said you wrote when you first came back to Singapore. There was a long form piece about the state of Singapore back then, la. and you mentioned that it was becoming what was the term you used, like a state that was um, catering to like like high net worth individuals. Yeah, high net worth individuals. So you know that was in twenty eleven. Yep. Right. So you know you mentioned how the media landscape and all is very different now. But starting with that point, 2011, catering to high, worth, high net worth individuals, then fast forward now, do you think Coldplay and Taylor Swift should be playing six concerts each? <laughs> Exclusively. <laughs> Exclusively in Singapore. That, yeah. hasn't, that hasn't been... That yeah, hasn't yeah, been yeah, 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 fact check, fact check. Pofma, Pofma coming. Real time fact checker here. Pofma coming. Because that's something that we have spoken about also. Yeah, like the media landscape is opening up. I mean, we have benefited from the landscape being opened up or more variety. But when you look at the way Singapore's growing... Um, yeah, it still feels like it's more of that, you know, and to a level that is even getting more extreme now. Yeah, and it's so interesting with ha- having moved here from Hong Kong, mm. right? I think, you, you know, you really um, can only now see the sort of implications of what happened in Hong Kong and how that's affected Singapore, right? Mm. I mean, you really see a lot of money, Chinese money, um, Hong Kong money, uh, coming to Singapore because it feels too politically exposed and um, too, people are too nervous to keep their money in China because mm. of its economy, because of the political situation, because of everything, right? And so, you know, I, I speak to sources quite a lot who tell me that their companies are moving their, you know, headquarters to Singapore. They're moving decision makers to Singapore. They're afraid of their data in Hong Kong. They're telling people to bring burner phones into mm. Hong Kong. You know, that's not something that companies and stuff have, have a fear with in Singapore, right? I mean, mm. especially the tech scene, that there is a trust that, you know, your data won't be breached or you won't be hacked or you're mm. not sort of susceptible to these kind of like, you know, sort of state interventions with, with your business practices. And so I think in, in the past few years, right, you've really seen um, like rental prices going up. You've really seen like money coming in in a huge way. A lot of this ties in as well to the big money laundering case that's mm. ongoing now mm-hmm. um, where obviously it's, uh, you know, the nationals of Cambodia and um, Turkey and other yeah, places, yeah, yeah. but really, you know, we're talking about sort of uh, uh, too as well. people from uh, of, of Chinese uh, origin, yeah. right? Mm. Who who were sort of doing kind of money laundering and related to to some you know sort of nefarious things happening within our region. So, I think I think it's it's something that definitely is something that the the, the government's grappling with, right? Like mm. on, on one hand, you have um, this, this this sort of money that's looking for places to go. Um, people are too scared to play in Hong Kong. I mean. You guys talked about Messi, right? Like mm, that was yeah, that was crazy, yeah. right? Mm. I mean, that was crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. and 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 you see that. What um, was crazy? Him not playing or the reaction? <laughs> the, the reaction. Yeah. Yeah. The, the fact that the reaction became a national security <laughs> yeah, issue. Yeah. Like, what in the world, right? And I think if you're like a concert, that you're like IMG or AEG looking at this, you're like, whoa, okay, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. no thanks. And they know, I mean, so many of my friends from Hong Kong are coming to Singapore, right? That mm. that, that six shows is is not for us. I mean, mm. not exclusively for us, right? Yeah. How many people do you know who are coming to Singapore for Coldplay and Taylor Swift, right? Mm. I mean, it's 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 sort of this role that Singapore has kind of taken on in, in the region region now, right? And and yeah, I mean, it's it, it will play out domestically in, 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 a, in a number of ways, I think. Mm. Mm. But but so to answer Harish's question, are you are you uh, are you happy that this is happening? That 
We're getting well, pillars. No <laughs> <laughs> People politically <laughs> charged. Did you go for Coldplay or are you going for Taylor Swift? Uh, I am going for Taylor Swift. Oh, you're going for Taylor Swift. Well, we can read between the lines <laughs> there. What the okay, but to, but to to be fair on the on the Taylor Swift point, right? Mm. I mean, I think I think there are certain like infrastructure things that mm. Singapore can offer that other places can't, right? Obviously, yeah, in Brazil, yeah, you yeah. saw there was like a stampede yeah, and was, stuff. I mean, I I do think that really, if she had a concert in Manila, like oh my god. Yeah, traffic. Crazy. The fan Not base just the traffic, crazy. the fan base. Yeah, the, the fan, fan base, base is, is insane. Crazy. I think people will like faint and like it would just, it would be crazy. So uh, yeah. I think Singapore is a place that, to be fair, can manage the infrastructure better than anywhere because the Taylor Swift insanity everywhere this, is crazy. It's yeah. not, mm-hmm. this is not a uniquely Singapore thing yeah. that people are crazy about Taylor Swift. Okay. So. I, I've heard some statistic that uh, Philippines uh, is the fourth largest nation yep. that streams Taylor Swift Correct. Yeah. on Spotify or something. Yep. Like yeah, I think you heard that from me. Yeah. Oh, I got, you got it from you. Yeah, you got it from me, yeah. <laughs> Or is it you just... On the last podcast, oh, I mentioned okay, it. Oh, yeah, okay, 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 okay. My uh, <laughs> shout out to our <laughs> Filipino uh, reporter at the Washington Post who actually hosts the Taylor Swift podcast and has, oh, from wow. the time I hired her in 2018, who's coming to sing for Taylor Swift. Oh, so she wow. hosts, like, because she's such a big fan. Yeah, 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 exactly. Holy crap. Yes. <laughs> the official Taylor Swift podcast. No, no, no. Oh, official, yeah, okay, okay, okay. But, it's but, like a but fan yes. podcast. Like but yes, so I think, yeah. That's ah, where a lot of the demand stuff has come So, so just, you know, like, like what you said about how in Singapore, yeah, there are things we can offer. It's partly also because of how, I mean, there are rules, people generally follow them and all. So looking back, right, you know, growing up in Singapore, going all around the world, coming back, do you think, do you look at this whole culture of, you know, you grew up in Singapore, you're told to follow the rules and people follow rules. Like, do you see it like differently from what you used to see last time? about the benefits of that sort of like upbringing and society? I mean, put it this way, I think there's a predictability to living here, including mm. when it comes to dealing with the government, right? I don't think it's a it's a surprise, generally speaking, um, if the government like uh, writes a letter to foreign media saying that they're not happy with the peace, right? I mean, I think that's something that we've been used to for decades. Mm. Um, and actually one can argue it's getting better, right? Because at least there is this like mechanisms, right? Like writing letters or POFMA or whatever. They're not just going to sue you straight away. There's a or, process now. We've moved, <laughs> we've moved in a... In a <laughs> or inviting, inviting them over for debates. Huh? Yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. With Richard Branson, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's a process. <laughs> but, you know, in, in general, um, I think I have reported in many places that I've seen get much worse. Mm. Hong Kong is the best example, right? Hong Kong was the sort of beacon um, in many ways for journalism in this part of the world, right? Um... Hong Kong was where we wanted to have a pretty big operation um, when I moved there in 2018. So this was before the protests and before the national security law and now Article 23. Um, But yeah, you saw the New York Times moved out. You know, you see uh, many, many journalists sort of uh, deciding that it's not safe enough for them to stay there and and so on, right? And and that has been one of the most dramatic shifts that we've seen within the media industry within our region. Mm. Um, And it's, it's, it's been really sort of disheartening to see, right? And and SCMP, which I think was always considered like a sort of regional gold standard, mm. right? Has, you know, a lot of reporting has shows has shown that they've become very controlled by, you know, different stakeholders and uh, business interests and, you know, state interests as well. So I think given all of that and and given the fact that, you know, a lot of these things are so unformed in other parts of the region, right? Like you have no idea what the red line is until it's mm. crossed and then you're like looking back and you're like, oh God, like what mm. have I done, right? Singapore is quite rules-based and quite predictable. Mm. And so it is much easier to operate within the confines of something that is a much more uh, decades formed thing mm. um, than something that is now only deteriorating um, and sort of, you know, with new laws and stuff being put in, right? And so I think I think Singapore does offer predictability for better or worse of, of doing business, including journalism. So, mm. yeah. Well, that's interesting. Huh? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, you, talking about the Hong Kong experience as well, I think uh, last year you also released yes. a book. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what the the premise of the book is and about how, how you came to write uh, about your experience in that way? Sure. So um, my husband's also a journalist. We decided to uh, write this book together. We are still married. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. I was like cooking a meal with my wife right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people, that's like the first question they ask. Right? Yeah. Oh my God, you wrote a book with your husband? <laughs> um, but yes, so that that is 
that we we, we just because you know he he writes for for the Atlantic um, magazine. You know, I was writing for the Washington Post. Sometimes we did um, stuff together because he was you know freelancing for a while, um, and it just felt like everything was so incomplete. Right, like we saw this incredible sort of. Uh, protest movement. We saw this, um, you know, so kind of like total kind of crackdown on like every institution. And really, we were on the front lines um, in many ways, especially during COVID, because nobody could come in to Hong Kong, right? Mm. They had also very strict kind of lockdown like like Singapore. So we felt like, okay, we need to record this, um, especially because history was also being erased as we as we spoke and as we even embarked on the book. You know, we 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 decided to um, frame the book around some uh, major sort of characters or players within the pro democracy movement in Hong Kong, um, and and use their sort of life experience and sort of their their own sort of journeys to kind of take a historical look at the evolution of the pro democracy movement. Uh, once we settled on a few people, you know, we scheduled interviews. Within like two weeks, one of them was in jail, you know, and and it was all like moving so quickly, and we were like, oh my god, we have to like really try to collect and collate everything we can and record it and write it down, you know. Some of the news organizations we were using to cite, um, for example, Apple Daily. By the time we got to our fact checking process, they were gone, mm-hmm. right? They were all taken down by by the government, and you know, are kind of going through the court process now. And so we, yeah, we just felt this like urgency to to kind of you know do this do this project. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's sort of no secret that if you take on something like this within the environment in Hong Kong now, um, there is a risk to staying, right? And um, that's a big reason why we decided to move back to Singapore. Mm. Um, you know. There are not many cities in this region that can act as a base for journalism, right? You really have a bunch of imperfect options after Hong Kong um, sort of fell apart as a place for, for for journalists, right? You have Bangkok, which you still have to deal with, less majesty and and, and sort of the, the the issues there with the monarchy. Um, you have Taiwan, which is very open in some way, but not if you're from mainland China, very hard mm. to get visas and stuff. And also has a pretty, like, not very good bureaucratic process around visas and stuff um, that is, is challenging. Um, and you have, like, Seoul, where a lot of media organizations have moved. But if you want to cover Southeast Asia, it's a bit far. Mm. So that's how we we kind of ended up in, in Singapore, because it, it really was, from a lot of perspectives, really the best other place to be based in in from the region. I mean, people always say, like, oh, like, you left Hong Kong, you go to Singapore, like, oh, there's no press freedom. Mm. I'm like, mm. yeah, I mean, but there is still, um, like I said, a certain kind of predictability to, to kind of operating here that, um, you know, I, I, I feel quite grateful for, I think. And I also know. because you are writing for an entity that is based out of Singapore about the region, does that give you, like, a different modus operandi almost? Not really. I think we're, we're still, I'm employed through a, you know, Local. Entity, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so see, it's see. it's it's sort of the same, um, and I think no matter who you are in Singapore, you are the law, it's applies to you equally. Mm, okay. um, but um, but but yes, I mean, I I, I still think that you know, uh, from a a bunch of you know very imperfect options, right? A lot of you see a lot of people having moved to Singapore, especially to cover China, mm. especially to cover China. Huh? So. Mm. Yeah. And how's the reception to the the book launch? And, yeah, it's been really good, yeah. and surprisingly, you know, there's been a lot of interest from Singaporeans. I think, mm. you know, I didn't realize quite how much um, Singaporeans sort of saw themselves as kind of kindred to Hong Kong. I mean, we share a lot of historical similarities, right? But both cities are sort of set up in the same way yeah. um, as sort of business, trade, finance hubs. It's an imperfect comparison, um, but you know, one of the main characters in our book, he actually lived in Singapore for a while, mm. and his experience in Singapore really sort of influenced what he thought about. Hong Kong, um, because he said, you know, in, in Hong Kong, the, the narrative is always that Hong Kong was too, too kind of small and, and, and could never be independent. You know, you can never think of it as an independent polity, right? Because, you know, it was always part of mainland China. You know, uh, the, the, the British interlude was, um, you know, uh, a sort of kind of illegal occupation, right? From the, from the British, so the, the sort of Chinese narrative. Um, but then, you know, coming to Singapore, we are independent. We're our own country, right? And we are also small. So I think it's like, it challenges a lot of, it challenged a lot of his views about how he he, he sort of saw Hong Kong and, and sort of how he saw, you know, what, what could be possible in a country that really had that independence to decide on their own what their future would be, right? Mm. Um, and and you know, um, when I when I had when I did the 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 rice interview, I was talking a little bit about this. Uh, the interviewer was like, "Wow, well, you're trying to get National Day of Water." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "No, I'm not trying to get National Day of Water." But um, 
and, and, I, and I definitely won't, I think. But um, I think I think there is something to be said, right? And and actually many, even in the pro-establishment in Hong Kong, have said this to me, you know, that you're so lucky you come from Singapore. At least the government has to be accountable to you, right? And that's true. Like, mm. that is true. The government has to fight for our vote, right? Mm, 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 um, mm. And that, that, is, that is something that you do see play out in our sort of day-to-day politics, right? Whether mm. you look at your surroundings, whether you look at HDB policy, whether you look at your playground or whatever. In Hong Kong, that's not true at all. The government doesn't have to, the, the, the citizens are not at all a constituent for them, right? It's mm. Beijing and developers and landowners and people who hold assets. So mm. it's a very different, very, very different um, kind of calculation. Right? And, and, and what is the, the book called? Where, should, where can people find it? It's called Among the Braves. Mm-hmm. Um, Kinukunia, it's still there. Um, on actually on the bestsellers uh, oh, section. Oh, sweet. Uh, but Amazon, anywhere, anywhere you get your books, it will be available. And that was the first book that you've written? Correct. Uh, do you plan to write more? Um, we shall see. Uh, so, yeah. um, publishing is, uh, is is a weird industry. Um, mm-hmm. It needs like I, I still need to get over the trauma of writing the first book before <laughs> I can <laughs> imagine doing doing a second. But yeah, it it it, it takes it definitely takes a lot out of you for sure. Um, and does um, does the publication of the book or, or your reporting has it uh, you know like traveling to Hong Kong for I mean even leisure or anything has that made it any harder or more difficult? Yeah, I I would say. Um, I don't think it's a, it's a secret, but I think uh, it's not going to be very easy for us to go back to Hong Kong anytime soon, mm. especially because they keep putting in sort of new new laws. Um, they're currently discussing a new domestic uh, national security law that I think will constrain space for media even more. And so mm. that's, yeah. I see, I see. That's um, just a reality of, you know, reporting in, in those sorts of places, I guess. And mm. and And it really is... Back to the red lines, right? I mean, yeah. you really don't know. You really don't know because the law is just being written now, right? So you yeah. have no idea what 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 sort of the limits and and and, and what sort of you know the the the, the kind of framework is. Mm-hmm. So just um and and one thing about the local media landscape, you know, there's there's the thing about the institutional in, like professional journalists, but in the maybe the lower level of people who are journalists in training, do you see more interest or do you see because you know certain um like undergraduate degrees and all you have more interest in some, less interest in some. How what's your take on the interest in journalism in Singapore? Yeah, I've actually been so gratified to see so many more people reach out to me interested in journalism as a career path from Singapore and, from Singapore and and different forms of journalism be it data journalism or whatever like a few years ago somebody reached out to me um asking me about you know uh having a career in journalism and she works for like the Indianapolis Star the Indy Star mm-hmm. in Indianapolis which like is pretty crazy um you know and it's really amazing to see Singaporeans like go so far and wide to kind of become you know really like um, like to cut their teeth in, in journalism. Um, Singaporeans are also disproportionately represented in the China, um, like China journalist sort of ecosystem mm, okay. um, because, you know, obviously a lot of Singaporeans speak Mandarin, right, fluently. And it is, you know, um, actually I, I'm, I'm quite proud to see so many Singaporeans overrepresented from the size of our country mm. within foreign, foreign media and around the world. And it's been kind of hardening. And equally, you know, um, younger people coming up to me saying like, you know, actually, I, I have a I have a degree in computer science, but I'm like really interested in data journalism, and I, I want to like take my computer science degree in in another direction. I mean, you can do far more lucrative things mm. with a comp- computer yeah. science degree <laughs> than going to media, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. but it's 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 really it's really kind of amazing to to see. Um, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And and if people wanted to find you online or like reach out, what where would be the best place? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, my DMs are open for better or worse. I mm-hmm. you know I leave them open for tips and people to contact me but then also means the trolls can find me <laughs> but but yes I'm, I'm easy I'm easy to find and your yeah. handle is uh, at Shabani Matani I see okay, okay cool Matani cool. sorry Me- 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 Matani yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to our Cindy yeah. listeners <laughs> Matani yeah <laughs> oh but that's cool yeah so that's your most active platform lah uh, um, Twitter, yeah, yeah, and um, and and LinkedIn, I guess, because mm-hmm. you know, LinkedIn has become, I think, like a little respite for now for journalism because there's like definitely fewer trolls and stuff on on the platform, oh, and it's more like genuine engagement with your 
with your stories and the you stuff don't you want to post. post on TikTok. The trolls there are like next no, level. No. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have TikTok. <laughs> you don't have ah, TikTok. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, we've 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 seen that recently. Yeah, it's because we have been making content online for a long time, and we've seen trolls across every platform. Yeah. TikTok takes it to another level. Yeah, yeah. TikTok uh, trolls hit differently. Yeah, yeah they yeah. hit differently. Yeah, yeah, correct, yeah. correct. Uh, yeah. So, so now, I mean, thanks for thanks for sharing. Now we just have one more final question for you, which is the one shock thing segment. Mm-hmm. Uh, Terence and I can go first. Yeah. Uh, sure. So you still have last minute sure. uh, yeah. to to think of something. <laughs> yep. You you have yours off the top of your head, Terence. You have yours. Uh, I will have to pull it up. Uh, mine. Yeah, actually, it's mm. uh, it's a video. I think it's by the Wall Street Journal uh, tech team. Um, basically. It's quite an interesting video that uh, I think just came out a couple of days ago. Um, yeah, two days ago. It's uh, let me just. Oh, sorry. Oh. It's titled <laughs> "Open uh, Open AI Sora: How to Spot AI Generated Videos." So it basically um, sort of they talk to an expert about how in the age of where AI is creating like photorealistic video, like what you have to look out for in the video to sort of spot that it's actually made by AI. Uh. Mm. And uh, I mean, you know, TLDR, like what, I think one interesting thing for me, even though we read a lot about this, these issues in, in filmmaking and all that, um, one interesting for me is the concept of um, hallucinating. Mm. That you got to think of the AI as, uh, rather than like intelligently or sorting stuff out together, the AI is sort of hallucinating as it creates a thing. So the longer you allow an AI to, you know, sink its teeth into a prompt or something, the more off the beaten track it actually gets. Mm. So that's the the way of saying that, you know, um, it'll be a while before AI is creating like feature length uh, movies that make coherent Mm. sense because once they start going down a a strange path, it just continues barreling down that path without realizing that it's breaking the laws of physics or or normal human relationships. uh. Mm. So uh, I guess there's a last line of defense for creative people, uh, right? Filmmakers and all about Longer form stuff actually still has a place in our society. But how will you spot it? Because there's a title of the video. So little things like uh, even now still uh, stuff like uh, fingers, fingers right? is yeah. still a big issue. Like creating fingers, mm-hmm. uh, the physics of of eating, for example, hmm. the physics of gravity and how things move around. Like you can tell them a uh, bit sheet flops this way, but when you watch it, you know that there's some there was something wrong with the way that bit sheet flopped. You know, it defied the laws of physics. Mm. So it's just these little little things that uh, apparently our human minds are really good at spotting like these really oddities, and they actually have a few examples of the videos in that uh, in there that point out. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen the Sora Sora AI videos? No. Oh, 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 it's yeah. uh, I mean, it's basically Open AI's uh, version of creating video from text, mm-hmm. and it's quite ridiculous, lah. It's not perfect, but it's quite ridiculous. Yeah, they even have like, if you, let's say you have one picture, you give it to Open AI Sora, they can create a video out of that static image. Yeah. So you're basically creating uh, like Pixar level animation just based on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. G- given we're all in media, I can see how that would be a one shock thing so that we know that maybe we won't be replaced by exactly. robots anytime soon. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, so yes. There is basically sh- like shitting on things, especially my one shock thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sora AI yeah, was, was my one shock thing a few weeks ago. Yeah. Let me contextualize <laughs> it again. Harish worships like technology without thinking about the larger context of how see, again, a robot will take your job. People, no, again, a broad stroke. Like, I, I find exactly, it interesting. Exactly. Touché, touché, I find it interesting, <laughs> but like, I am not just a whole like blind faith believer, Terrence. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So basically, we have a balance, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more cynical he becomes, the more I'm like, oh, this is so good. Watch this, Terence. Oh, mine was like the Wall Street Journal, you know, stepping in to, you know, uh, give some what facts. What a suck up, man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my one shock thing uh, was uh, is an Instagram account that uh, someone told us recently, uh, whom we met. It's called Treasure at Home. So they basically are uh, 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 like they, they call themselves the leaders of Singapore's local vintage scene. You know them? Ah, okay. Mm. So yeah, they're so, legit. They're very cool. Yeah, it's mm. cool. It's like a from what is it? A family family yeah. started this, and they buy vintage stuff. They sell vintage stuff, and their Instagram, uh, yeah, they have some pretty cool stuff uh, specific to Singapore. Like even. Uh, posters of the uh, original PAP political poster dated to the ni- from the 1950s or 70- uh, 60s. 
So yeah, so I mean, the Instagram is cool. They have a bunch of cool stuff. Have you got anything from there? Yes, I got those like you know old A and W cups. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They're really cool. They're really cool. Ah, like okay. the Tiger Beer, yeah, yeah, yeah. original Tiger Beer. Mask. Oh sweet, oh. yeah. So treasure, treasure at home. You can look them up in, on Instagram. Uh, it's so, a yeah. physical store, right? It's a physical store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the owners also quite quite social media savvy, like They make videos yeah. talking about what they have and all. And yeah, some some cool stuff. Yeah, he's super friendly. If you like huh. WhatsApp him, he will like, if you say, oh, I'm in the market for like an old sign or I'm in the market for this or that, mm. stuff comes in, he'll tell you. Oh, oh nice. nice. Yeah. Wow. Oh, cool. Uh, okay, so that's those are all one show things. What's your one show thing? So I watched a film kind of recently at the um, Singapore International Film Festival, mm. okay. which I thought was really, really cool and very interesting. Um, it was a documentary from the Philippines mm. uh, called The Ghosts of Kalan Show. Mm. It was super interesting. It was basically about historical revisionism and kind of who writes history and who decides what's history. So basically, there is this sort of myth in this one little kind of village or province in the Philippines that there was this guy called Dato Kalancho and he created the first sort of legal code in the, you know, in, in the Philippines and he's like revered and there's like a day to celebrate him and everything. Promise is all fake. Mm. It was written by like a fraudster who like sold it um, and like literally wrote the thing on like bark to make it look oh, old, but it was like oh. totally fake, right? And, you know, when a historian discovered that it was fake, uh, there was a huge uproar in this community and mm. stuff. And so the filmmakers went back to the town to kind of ask them like how they feel about their sort of, the, their, their kind of like legend being told to them now that it's fake, mm. but they tied it in with historical revisionism and, and sort of what the Marcoses are doing with sort of rewriting history in the Philippines and, and sort of, you know, whitewashing the kind of past as well, right? So mm. really the, 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 the kind of theme there was like who who kind of controls the truth, right? Who mm. who who gets to make the truth? Um, and yeah, I thought it was I thought it was super interesting, very interesting to what I was saying before. They got a grant from the Singapore International Film Festival to do this documentary. Oh, okay, but they've had struggles showing the thing in the Philippines. Right. Uh, so it's like, you know, the the kind of what is sensitive to one place is not sensitive uh, to another place. Yeah. Right. Like it's something that like Filipinos can watch in Singapore, but they can't watch in the Philippines. You know, uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, uh, but very worth checking out. I think very resonant to, you know, all of us who think of, you know, history and nation building and myths and legacies. And so it premiered at the SGIFF. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. nice. So is it running in theaters now or like where can... Yeah, I'm not sure but I think... People I think can look it up. I think we can look it up. Yeah, I think the the, the filmmakers are hoping to like continue sort of playing it um, around the around the region, around Singapore. And, so and what's it called again? The Ghosts of Kalan Shaw. Kalan Shaw. Mm. Oh, K- K-A-L-A-N-T-I-A-W. Okay, I see. Yes. Cool. Ah, got it. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I was just spelling it in my head. Yeah, uh, we'll put a link in the in yeah, the description yeah, yeah. line in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, cool. Thanks cool. so much for Thanks joining for us. By. Of course, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was yeah. it was awesome, and like, yeah, hopefully we can have you back again sometime. Sure. Yeah. Just cool. No opinions. No. <laughs> <laughs> or the next time, Fika. Next time, Fika. Next time, yeah, yeah, that's we'll true. Have you back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but thanks for thanks for listening, everybody, yeah. and we'll talk to y'all soon. <laughs>